Well, good afternoon, uh, Grace Church and whoever else may be listening to this. I hope there's people not from Grace Church listen to it. That'd be, uh, that'd be great. But uh, lovely day. Hope you're all uh, keeping well. We're uh, hopefully on our way out of lockdown. So there's a bit of light at the end of the tunnel, which is, which is great. Um, have you guessed? You've got me for this week's talk. And uh, we are carrying on with the um, parables. Um, and we're going to be looking today at Matthew 20 verses 1 to 16. So let me just um, pray before I start. Lord, we just come to you, Lord, and we thank you for this lovely day, Lord. The sun is out and the sky is blue, Lord. Lord, I just pray now that everything that you want me to communicate, Lord, comes from you, Lord, and, and not from me, not from my, my heart, Lord, but from your word and your heart of what you want to communicate through your word, Lord. Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity, Lord. I thank you for my Grace Church family, Lord, and I pray that they'll be enthused and encouraged by what I've got to say. Lord, we... Love you, Lord. We just thank you for all your provision to us, Lord. Amen. Amen. So here we go. So I've been asked to um, speak about the parable of the workers in the vineyard. So the best way to describe, if you haven't heard this before, I'm sure you have. I've, I've said it before and I don't know whether others have, but the best way to describe a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So Jesus uses parables throughout um, the Bible to communicate to different various people, um, but they're an earthly story about a heavenly meaning. So we are going to look at um, Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16. So I'm just going to read that now. I was just great listening to Emma last week. She's a lovely reader, Emma. Is. I wish I was half as good at reading as Emma is, but I'm going to put my glasses on. I'm going to try my best to, to read well. Let me have a little little drink for it. A bit of energy. Right, here we go. So, Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into the vineyard. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again in the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour, he went out and, find, and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages. Beginning with the ones hired, with, sorry, beginning with the last ones hired, and going down to the first. The workers who were hired in the 11th hour, each came and received a denarius. So when, so when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began grumbling against the land owner. These men were hired last and only worked one hour. You have made us equal to them who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. The landowner answered, Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Did you not agree to work for the denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I've given to you. Do I have the right to do what I want to do with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. So I'm not sure about you when, when you heard that or if you've just read it along with me. 
hard to sort of uh, comprehend it as not being a little bit harsh in the sort of way that we think. You know, those men had been in the field for 12 hours slaving away and the guys that came for one hour got exactly the same pay. Now, I, I don't know whether you're like me or whether you're not or whether you're far more gracious than me, but it's very hard to think that it's a little bit unfair. But when I was doing a bit of research, I, I found another sort of um, side to the story, another way the story is described. So um, I just want to read that to you just to, to, to sort of get a different sort of slant on um, on the way the story perhaps could have been told from somebody else. So excuse me when I just uh, load this up. So here we go. It's getting dark and nervously she paces her modest home. She is worried. Nervously she sleeps the dirt from the floor from one side to the other. She stares into the darkness. It is late and she begins to pray. Oh God, oh God, where is my Joseph? Where is he, Lord? It's getting late and I know he didn't find any work today. I went to the marketplace and I saw him standing there still late into the afternoon. Oh Lord, where is he? Has something happened to him or is he too ashamed to come home empty handed? Her, pet, her prayer is broken by a tug on her dress. It's her five-year-old daughter, Elizabeth. Little Elizabeth asks, Mama, where is Daddy? Why has Daddy not come home yet? Is he bringing us something to eat? Mama, I'm hungry. And with that, the door bursts open. Hello, Elizabeth. Hello, Rebecca. Prepare the table. We have a feast. Look, I have bread. I have cheese. I have figs. And for the two women in my life who I love the most, I have a little bit of honey. Joseph, his wife says, where did you get all this? I know you didn't work. I went by the marketplace and I saw you standing there late into the afternoon. He said, the most amazing, the most marvellous thing happened to me today. It was getting late in the day and many had given up. Others had gone to work and a few of us were just standing there. I couldn't come home empty handed, so I stayed. I couldn't stand another night lying in bed where sleep would not come, my empty stomach growling. Hearing those words from our daughter, Daddy, I'm hungry. I was almost ready to give up when around about the 11th hour, the most unusual thing happened. And trust me, I pressed the wrong button. It was all, I was almost ready to give up and around about the 11th hour, the most unusual thing happened. A fellow came up and he yelled to us and asked why we weren't working. We said, no one hired us. He said, I'll hire you. Come on and work. It was late in the day, but a few pennies was better than nothing at all. So I went and worked in the vineyard. There were people there who'd been there all day. They'd been there for 12 hours. You could tell they were tired. It was a hot and dusty day. We worked only for an hour. Then the landowner gathered us together to pay us. And you would not believe it. He paid us first. The ones who had only worked an hour, he paid us first. Some had worked three, six, nine, twelve hours. And you know what? He gave us the wage of the entire day, what he paid everybody else. We worked one hour, but we got paid for the entire day. I was so, so happy and so joyous. I ran to the marketplace and bought all this food. Doesn't it look good? Isn't it wonderful? We shall have a feast tonight. As I was in the marketplace, I heard some of the workers that had been there all day grumbling. They were just downright mad. I didn't say anything, I just came home. I couldn't wait to get home and spread this feast before your eyes. Let us gather round the table and thank God for his generosity towards us. Joseph, may I ask something? His wife asked. Yes, honey. I'm curious, why are there just three loaves 
instead of the customary four. And are my eyes deceiving me? It looks like someone has cut off half of the cheese. Well, you're right, he said. I hope it's okay. But on the way home, I thought of the widow and I stopped by her house and gave her some of the bread and some of the cheese. Wiping tears from her eyes, Rebecca said, Oh, my dear Joseph, my kind and generous Joseph, you know that is more than a right. Let's bow and thank God. Now, what a difference of looking at the same um, scripture in a slightly different way. Now, I, I, I don't know about you, but when I look at it that way, I don't feel so bad. I don't feel so bad for those workers that have only worked an hour because the landowner was generous. God is a generous God. So, you know, I like my um, alliteration. So I've got three G's for you today. So we've got God's generosity, which we've uh, seen a little bit of so far. God's grace and God's greatness. So you've got God's generos generosity. Wait, keep banging. God's generosity, God's grace and God's greatness. So let's look at God's generosity first. The landowner in this story uh, in Matthew represents God. And in verse 15, he, he asks the question to those people that are grumbling. Are you envious? Because I am generous. Now, those of you that are saved, those of you who know, know the Lord, know what a generous, generous God he is. And as I was going through the sermon, I, I just thought of some of the things that God has given us. And, and the most important thing he's given us, and it says in John 3, 16, the most famous verse, for God so gave his only begotten son. He gave us his son who died for us on that cross so we could have eternal life. What an amazing thing to give us his son, his only begotten son. Thinking about it, he gave us the world we live in and some of the things that have come up with. He gives us our families, our friends, our church, the things that we need. He gives us so much. And I think perhaps on Tuesday would be a great idea to look at this further. I won't go into it too much today, but let's look at it a bit further. Let's talk about some of the things, how generous God's been to us over the years in the way that he's forgiven us, in the way that he's blessed us, in the way that he's healed us. In, there's so many ways that God has been generous and he is such a, a generous God. Um, I could give you hundreds of different verses on um, the way that he's been um, generous to us, but one of my, one of my favourites is in, uh, in Jeremiah 29, um, verse 11, another um, famous verse which says this, for I know the plans I have for you, said the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. We've got a generous God that wants to prosper us and give us a hope and a future. What an amazing God we had. But you know what? God also wants us to be generous. As Christians and as people, God's people, he wants us to be generous with each other, with our neighbours, with our friends, with our family. Now, another bit of alliteration for you. He wants us to be generous with three T's. Our time, our talent, and our treasure. Because you know what? God gives us all of those things. And we can be generous with our time, helping people, visiting people, giving people a, a call or a text. With our talent, God has given us all different types of talent. Some of us are good at putting the chairs out. Some of us are good at singing. Some of us are good at speaking. Some of us are good at encouraging. Some of us are good at putting books together to take around or leaflets together to take around. Some of us are good at practical things. We're all good at different things. And, and, and God wants us to use the talent he's given us for him and to further the kingdom. With our treasure, with our, with our money that, gives, that God gives us, he wants us to be generous. He wants us to help others around us. He wants to be he wants us to give to the church, so let's be generous with those three things, with our time, our talent, and our treasure. I just want to read another verse before we move on to the, the second G, which comes from Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 8. And this is what it says. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will reap generously. 
For each man should give what he's decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound you so that in all things at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. God wants us to be generous, a cheerful giver. The second G, God's grace. Now, like those, um, that landowner, he was very gracious and God is very gracious to us. Now, this is a harsh verse, but it is so, so true. In Romans 6, verse 23, like those uh, workers, they thought their wages should have been the same for working didn't thought they should have been more, rather, for working 12 hours than one. But do you know what? Do you know what our wages should be? In Romans 6, verse 23, says this. For the wages of sin is death. Now, there's not anybody amongst us that hasn't sinned. That's what our wages should be. But do you know what comes afterwards, that but? And what a but it is, it says, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Jesus Christ our Lord. What an amazing but that is. If we choose to follow him, we will have eternal life in Jesus. You know what? We deserve nothing. We deserve death. That should be our wage. But you know what? God is an amazingly gracious God. Did the those that worked one hour deserve those that worked twelve? They probably didn't, but this passage just wants to show us how gracious God is we don't get what we deserve in verses 19 um, verse 30 there's uh, a verse that gets repeated in, in our chapter I just want to read it again so in verse 19 chapter 30 it says but many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. And also the landover, a landowner says in um, chapter 16, uh, verse 16 in, in the next chapter. So will the first be last and the last be first? A, a hard, tricky sort of uh, verse to understand that is, you know, what does that mean? Let the first be last and the, and the last be first. Now, I've read loads of different commentaries and read loads of different ex. Experts, no, excerpts or experts? Oh, experts giving excerpts um, from uh, the internet about what this actually means. And theologians have all got their different sort of um, ideas from, but for what it's worth, this is what I've picked up from it in a, in a simple version. Now, I just wanna tell you what I think it is through a story. Now, when I was at um, Elim for a number of years, for 20 odd years, we had a, a wonderful pastor there called Phil Hills. And him and his wife, Lynn, had been in ministry for probably about 30 years at the time bef before, before they left. And they were amazing, amazing examples of Christians. Now, they used to serve God with their time, their talent and their treasure. And, and especially Lynn, Phil would be all over the country preaching and, and Lynn would be serving the church. And as a Christian, she, all she ever wanted was to see her mother get saved. She would often talk to people and, and say, pray for my mother, pray for my mother. I, I want to see her saved. I want to see her saved. And uh, she would always say to her mother, look, you know, it's a great life. You know, you, you want you want to become a Christian. I'm praying for you. And, and she would do everything she could. She would take her to meetings. She would take her to rallies. She would take her to places where she would hear God's word and, and never ever would her mother respond to the gospel. And it was a, it was something that Lynn really was desperate to do. And as I say, she'd served the Lord for 30, 30 years at least by, by this point. And uh, her mother became very ill and on her deathbed, um, Lynn was by the side in the hospital. And she said, you know what, mum? She said, all, all I've ever wanted, she said, is is for you to become a Christian. And do you know what she said? It's not too late. It's not too late. I, I know you're dying. It's not too late. She said, if you call out to Jesus now, he will hear you and he will hear your cry. And when you, when you go, you'll be in heaven with him. 
and the second just before she died in a Geordie accent she shouted out how are Jesus how are Jesus and called out to him on her last breath and she died and you know what the joy that it gave Lynn uh, an amazing story to hear that in that last moment Lynn's mother called out to Jesus and she'll be in heaven so one day Lynn who has served Jesus for 30, 40 years probably now, with her time, her talent and her treasure, will be in the same place as her mother, who on her deathbed, who her last words were calling out to Jesus. That's my take on, let the last be first and the first be last. God is so gracious to us. It doesn't matter what we do throughout Christian life. If somebody else calls out to him and asks them into their heart, they will get the same reward in us as us, which will be eternity in heaven. So coming on to the last G, which is God's greatness. Now, there's two things that kept coming to me when I was starting to write about God's greatness. I was going to go into Bible and the Bible and pull out verses that show God's greatness. But two things came. One was a song. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God and all will sing how great how great is our God not bad for a bold fat man but anyway the other thing that came to me is amazing now I know a number of you have seen this I was going to put a link on but I'm going to play it and listen to it again myself because it's so inspirational now this guy um oh I don't know how I'm going to do this this guy um, is on YouTube and you've heard him before. He is called SM Lockridge and he gives a three minute um, talk on how great our God is. Now, I can't present it any better than this. So I thought I'm not going to. I'm just going to show you his video. And this is the last point. How great is our God? Now, I'm not sure how this is going to work, but I hope it does because I can't turn the camera around. So let's see if this works. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. The diligent and he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomparable. He's 
Amazing. For those that um, want to watch that again without my double chin in the background, I'll I'll place a uh, I'll place a link up uh, for you um, after the talk. But what a great God that we serve! And one of the questions that kept repeating through there was, "Do do you know Him? Do you know Him?" And if you don't know Him, I want to urge you to get to know Him. Read His Word. Speak to other Christians. He's an amazing God. He's a gracious God. He's a generous God. And he certainly is a great God. Love you all. I hope you have a great rest of the afternoon. God bless.